Hello, and welcome back to Cultures of the Crisis, the lecture series about cultural studies perspectives on Corona and beyond, presented to you, as it were, by the Chair Group European Culture and Literature at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. My name is Florian Lippert, and I have the pleasure to moderate today's session on one of those fields in which, according to today's speaker, the corona health crisis not only causes new social and cultural issues, but also reveals old ones. So the corona crisis uncovers problems that have been there before. In this field we're talking about is the so-called social fabric, so broadly speaking, our connections to other people. And uh, the expert who will speak about the crisis of connection today is my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Vera Alexander, who is a senior lecturer in our chair group, European Culture and Literature. Vera's uh, research interests comprise eco-criticism, post-colonial, transcultural and diasporic studies, travel and mobility, life writing, the Bildungsroman and children's writing. Currently, Vera is completing a monograph on Anglophone garden writing as life writing funded by the Danish Carlsberg Foundation. And gardens will indeed also play a role in her presentation today. And here she is. Dear Vera, what a joy to have you here today. Please do tell us more. OK, let's see. How are we doing, Florian? Can you see my slide? Yes. All works fine. And see me. Okay, we are off. Good morning and welcome to lecture four in this series. Thank you to my wonderful colleague and friend Florian for setting up this lecture and um, this entire series. It's a wonderful idea, it's a wonderful opportunity, and um, thank you for inviting me to join. Uh, it's a privilege to work with you and with all the other great colleagues in Pablo's chair group. And I really can't wait to go out for, to dine with you again as soon as. Um, you know, circumstances return to a more normal state. I would also like to thank everybody who ha has been and is following guidelines and staying at home and the students who are dealing so creatively and constructively with our disembodied teaching. And I would like to pay special respect to those of our students who are currently um, working part time in the care sector. Um, you're doing a great job. And to everybody who is currently feeling completely overwhelmed and is sick and feeling bewitched, bothered and bewildered by this situation, hang in there. Because they say about children that everything is a phase, but the more I'm, I hang around, I feel that this is true for the entire planet. Everything is a phase. And with this in mind, I would actually like, before I get to the crisis of connection and into the garden that I'm already heralding in this slide, I would like to uh, start with a brief disclaimer. The Indian novelist and musician um, Amit Chaudhary has produced this poignant reflection on the relationship that exists between living and experience, going through something big, um, such, as a, such as this large scale traumatic event that we're currently undergoing and um, any kind of interpretation, writing about it, talking about it, the kind of thing that we're trying to do in this lecture series. His example is the partition of India in uh, the dividing up of the country, which was a very bloody affair. It might be said, he writes, that freedom and the partition of India, these big events, which would act my parents' lives profoundly were met by them with a certain degree of incomprehension and even indifference. For key moments, unlike their representation later in texts or lectures, do not really have clear outlines and might not even be perceived as having really happened. The human reaction to change, whether personal or in the form of historical events, is extremely complex, a hiatus of the mystery or incomprehension of a response not allowed for in official versions of history. A hiatus, a caesura, a break or time lag, a rupture. This is essentially what a crisis is. And we've been in crisis for uh, well nigh as long as we can remember. All of modernity has been framed as a crisis. And now 
another layer, another rupture occurs. And um, it's important to take these breaks to process. It's important to have a caesura. They're just as important as what is being said for processes of learning and processing or comedy or anything. So let's acknowledge a break, the importance of a hiatus. Everybody have a stretch, look up, look up from your screen, look at something, smile at something, and then come back. And then we go properly into today's topic. The crisis of connection is something that has been attested by a bundle of scholars who in 2018 published a book under this title, and they attest that at the beginning of the 21st century, we are beset by a crisis of connection. People are increasingly disconnected from themselves and each other with a state of alienation, isolation and fragmentation characterizing much of the modern world. This is 2018. So this is before Corona. The quintessential we, as in we the people, or we hold these truths to be self-evident, which once served as a reference to a collective consciousness and state of communion, if not community, has lost all meaning. In the place of the we, we have been left with the me, the solitary individual whose needs, wants, and desires take precedence over the collective, end of quote. This is a multidisciplinary analysis in pedagogy, gender studies, sociology, um, a combination effort between natural and social sciences. And um, they attest that the crisis of connection um, is characterized by certain signs and symptoms such as decreasing levels of empathy and trust, a rise in depression, loneliness, um, even suicide and violence of various forms, including domestic violence. And I think in, in these days we have to be a particularly aware of this. High rates of incarceration, hate crimes, astronomical inequality. And I think this is something that we see daily in our newspaper articles, just the way in which inequality has risen and um, the global connectedness uh, via Zoom exists. We are obviously um, <laughs> celebrating the fact that we have global connectedness, but at the same time, um, many people, while they are coming across the globe, might not have anybody in their direct neighborhood that they could call on to go to the pharmacy if they need somebody. And I think in the given situation, this is something that we see a lot and um, that we're coming to terms with. and um, which is perhaps changing. One of the observations that the authors of The Crisis of Connection make is that humans are inherently relational and responsive beings, born with the ability to communicate and engage with others and with a desire to live in relationships. Um, they also attest that it is our tendency towards altru altruism and cooperation which has enabled us to survive as a species. And those of us, those of the students who might remember, we um, been referring to Yuval Noah Harari's 21 lessons for the 21st century a lot because he makes a similar observation. Um, so this crisis of connection has been um, addressed for more than 20 years in social sciences and uh, such as these books and also literary criticism and in the humanities it has been taken up recently by this volume of um, essays um, written by various scholars from literary studies and various branches of philosophy who um, emphasize that there is an ethical impulse and aspect to our relationality. This uh, has to do with our ethical capacity and uh, they refer to Judith Butler's work and essentially define the crisis um, of connection as a crisis both of communication and of the imagination. What is intriguing here, they say, is that this relationality scholarship and the crisis of connection that they're writing about seems to have made very little impact on the popular imagination, which continues to be dominated by idealizations of freedom, independence and autonomy, especially in our anxious neoliberal times. And um, the students who've been following us uh, through the literary profile will recognize these qualities, freedom, independence, and autonomy, because they go back to enlightenment um, ideals. And these are powerful, these are, these are forces which are strong in us. And according to the Angelaki authors here, they impede our ability to, uh, to connect. Um, the most prominent example they cite in response to um, this failure of the imagination to admit uh, connective 
um, trait in our way of, re um, of interacting is the appointment of the world's first Minister for Loneliness in 2018 by Theresa May. Um, there have been several incumbents in this position and it's not something we hear about a lot. Um, in eco-criticism, this need to recognize interconnectedness as an important factor um, is something that has been studied for years and um, it includes, and this is the main point that I want to make in this talk and to expand, um, one thing is of course to make the crisis of connection more visible and to give more vis visibility to the problems related to it. Um, and the other thing is add an embodied element to the talks that have been going on before and possibly also to do something that is a bit uplifting. Um, in eco-criticism, the urgency of developing an understanding of the interdependency of human beings in their social selves and the environment that surrounds them has been an important issue for decades um, with these books as an example. Another illustration that you might actually visit at the moment because this film is available for free, like many things in um, in the cyber in cyberspace at the moment is the economics of happiness a film that follows this connection of crises in the social ecological and economic spheres across six communities in different continents um, so this is a general crisis that uh, we can associate with modernity and that we might be aware of and along comes the coronavirus and along comes a situation these are pictures taken from my direct um, surroundings in Groningen along comes a moment where people are um, rediscovering the global uh, sorry the local in this global situation because literally the moment that a lockdown was pronounced I started to get letters in my letterbox I saw these signs in windows people offering to go shopping for their neighbors, to uh, rediscover neighborhood and to, to rediscover the solidarity that was spoken about as such an important issue in um, the first lecture in this series given by Professor Pablo Valdivia and others. So this idea of, uh, of solidarity is possible, it what has been possible, it, it carries on and um, in a sense we see that it is possible to change one's habits of relating to the local. People have been discovering their neighbors and have been doing a lot of things for them. And uh, so difference is possible, change is possible. And this is part of the experience that we're taking on board these days, part of the lesson essentially. And I think this is something that can be interpreted as hopeful. The fact that we can change and the fact that now globally we have an experience of having our complete um, habits of living, of being uh, near other people, of relating to other people socially, redefined and changed literally overnight. Um, so solidarity is something that relates in the social sphere and that has been mainly talked about in the so social sphere, um, not least by this image, which I think many people have seen. But my po point in this talk is it only works and if, if we expand the idea of solidarity and think beyond the social sphere and include the environment in our conceptualizations of the crisis of connection and this doability that we um, that we saw with the with these posters, the fact that people rediscover their local social surroundings is mirrored. I I say or I think in um, the direct environment, for instance, in the shape of people turning to their gardens. In uh, the words of Kenneth. Help hand in defiant gardens. Gardens represent in intimate ways our connections to the natural world. Um, they do something with boundaries. The word garden comes from, the, the etymology comes from the idea of enclosure. And um, in, in that sense, the garden helps, have, helps us have an experience of boundaries and um, also gives a sense of certainty and directness and material experience in relation to where we are, an, an experience of the local. 
there are, there, there are very many things you can do in the garden. You can sit and read a book, but you can also do things that are more embodied practices. Mm. So the idea of the garden um, as a site which is not merely um, one of distraction, but also one of taking action where you can make a difference. This is kind of important. Gardens are good to think with, to um, uh, modify Lévi-Strauss, but um, they're also sites of embodied practices. So you can look around and find um, videos and uh, articles that explain just how many great exercises you can do while you're working in a garden, um, which muscle groups you work on. That's another sector um, of experiencing direct space, doing something that is, of course, of benefit to one's health. So the idea of the garden is, um, is quite powerful here because it can be as small as a window box or house plants or just grabbing a few peas from your from your kitchen and putting them in a, a cup full of soil. So it doesn't have to be a large um, space in order for experiences of transformation to become directly um, accessible in everybody's lives. And that's why, uh, in part, gardens have become such a powerful um, element in uh, media landscapes relating to the current crisis, not just this crisis. Um, if you have the time, there is also, um, and, and by this stage in the academic year, I expect many students will um, be in need of lighter reading than um, the academic works that are cited earlier. So there is a popular uh, journalistic approach to this. Um, you can also listen to the TED talk by Johan Hari about, uh, you know, sort of overcoming depression in alternative ways, among them gardening. So he, in every talk, he cites this um, anecdote on uh, some people in East London um, who came off their antidepressant medication in relation to being put on a gardening, a local gardening project, rescuing the so-called dog shit alley in East London from um, the, the eponymous um, excrement and turning it into a garden helped their mental health. A more research-based um, idea is here, Richard Thompson's article on gardening for health. It is prescribed regularly, corona or not, to people who have various um, issues, both mental and physical health, can be addressed. And we have seen in, re I don't know if you've paid attention to it, but you can find heaps of journal articles around the world. Um, this is from Reuters. Home gardening blooms around the world during coronavirus lockdowns. And you can see that this is um, a busy mother who literally has um, things on her hands, children on her hands, and this is a, a holistic form of uh, occupation where um, learning can take place, where children can be um, occupied. The um, venerable BBC show um, Gardener's Question Time, which is one of the longest running shows, has adapted to the lockdown and um, runs a, a, a weekly column of advice on how to keep children busy in the garden during the lockdown and even in, in times after. And of course, this is May in Europe. This is the ideal time to get out and, and do some digging. Um, there are some examples here. The left one is from Canada. The right one is from India. So um, around the world, of course, this is a perspective on people who are privileged enough to have homes and to have some kind of um, certainty in these times. And there has been a lot of publication on the various things that um, can change. The idea of growing food um, has come up. And it, in this article by um, Charlotte Mendelssohn, printed in The New Yorker, we see that a lot of romanticization of gardening occurs. The tonic of gardening goes back to a quotation by um, Henry David Thoreau. So the idea of the garden as a space that is romanticized as a, a side of holistic endeavor um, is quite prominent. And also uh, there are some books that um, give advice on how you could garden your way out of anxiety in ways. In this case, it's a different kind of anxiety that the author of A Victory Garden for Trying Times has come back with an article here about how current situations can be addressed. In a sense, going back to the local 
feels like going back in time, <clears throat> rediscovering your neighbors, rediscovering who actually lives here um, around you, people walking about, walking down the street, carrying a half drunk glass of wine because they've just been toasting the neighbors across two meters of distance. This is something that we haven't seen for decades because we were too busy being elsewhere. And not surprisingly, and it's also in line with something that was talked about in earlier lectures, the prevalence of uh, imagery and metaphors of war. Um, a lot of the garden writers and a lot of the um, advice um, aimed at prospective new gardeners takes up war metaphors and takes up the idea of um, uh, returning to uh, victory gardening, um, which we associate with um, world wars um, and the idea of uh, people using what they've got, what is directly in front of them, what is directly surrounding them to grow food and to regain a kind of uh, communal form of autonomy. So this is a, a way of, uh, an idealized way, perhaps, of um, conceptualizing the autonomous individual as somebody who has and cultivates a local community. So what I'm trying to do in, in these slides, apart from throwing in a lot of pictures that I've been taken, taking of late, is to take um, something like Marc Auger's The Anthropology of the Near, um, Europeans studying cultures outside of Europe, and I would like to take that and essentially create the concept of an ecology of the near, a kind of shared interest in what is directly in front of us, what is directly surrounds us. Um, there are some examples that show that this has been going on in different places in the world, even before Corona. So, for instance, there was a recent article in The Guardian about a Costa Rica suburb that granted citizenship to bees plants and trees to non-human subjects. Earlier in, in his talk, Dr. Alberto Goggioli talked about a goat. Here we're talking about bees. The idea, um, the former mayor um, Mora to, um, says, comes from a narrative that people in cities are prone to defending nature when it is far away, when it is a distant concept, but they are negligent when it comes to protecting nature in their immediate environment. We need a change of mind. We need a change and maybe some area of practice and possibly a lockdown to experience new skills and to use our time slightly differently to um, approach a narrative that embraces the ecology of the near, the kinds of things that surround us directly. Um, an example of this is um, another article that was published in The Guardian a few weeks ago by a sports photographer. I realized, he writes, that I had to reframe and refocus, obviously, photographic language, because that is what matters to him, with all my normal avenues for taking pictures closed off. I needed to find something else. I recall the words of Ed Jackson, a former professional rugby player whose point I had taken exactly a year earlier. After suffering an awful accident that had left him partially paralyzed, he had developed a mental process to cope with this new situation. Focus on what's in front of you. Focus on things you can affect and try to forget what's out of your control. So in a sense, um, what I'm arguing for is taking small steps in the near local surroundings and um, complementing the worrying about grand narratives or the absence of grand narratives and the absence of a great new vision for how the world can develop and complement this by various acts that uh, enhance personal and communal well-being such as um, paying attention to what is around us um, honing our skills of observation and um, in this sense what um, tom jenkins writes exemplifies this, whether you take a spade and actually plant something or whether you go around with your mobile phone looking and trying to sort of appreciate what is directly around um, makes very little difference. There is a kind of um, a, a new appreciation of what is directly surrounding us. Remembering the advice of Ed Jackson, this uh, rugby player who was um, unable to carry on as before 
I looked around the edge of the tiny piece of lawn and noticed some tulip bulbs that my wife had planted in terracotta pots. Lush green leaves with buds full of promise had emerged from the soil, ready to bloom. In these plants, I saw hope. I saw normality. And this idea of normality as something that we redefine is, uh, is quite powerful and is something that we can observe in many different places. In France, in Toulouse, there were there, um, this is the place where an initiative began to um, point to ordinary weeds, the kinds of things that we generally pull out and try to remove, the things that are most adapted to our climate and our surroundings, but don't usually look great, um, to take not just graphs of them, but to give them names, because the botanical names of these, naming uh, any fairy tale will tell you is of enormous power to make you change your relationship. It gives you power over um, over something in stories. So if you know the name of something, you have power. It's a form of appropriation. It creates a relationship. It creates a kind of connection that forces you to look again. Um, Boris Presek, um, the botanist in charge who, of, of this initiative, says, I wanted to raise awareness of the presence, knowledge, and respect of these wild plants on sidewalks. People who had never taken the time to observe these plants now tell me their view has changed. Schools have contacted me since to work with students on nature in the city. Nature that is not designed by humans, but nature that is present and initiatives uh, of a similar uh, nature have been taken up in other cities, even in uh, countries where it's actually illegal to chalk anything on the floor. Botanical chalking gives a quick blast of nature connection as the words encourage you to look up and notice the tree above you, the leaves, the bark, the insects, the sky. And that's all good for mental health. So uh, an appreciation for local surroundings as a way of addressing the double bind in which human beings um, generally interact with the environment, as pointed out by Michael Pollan. There were the earth gardeners, we are also its weeds. We're the ones that are destroying a lot of things. And we won't get anywhere <clears throat> until we come to terms with this crucial ambiguity about our role. For instance, by redefining our concept of what useful and we useful plants and weeds are, uh, botanists will tell us that a lot of the so-called weeds that we pull out are actually much more popular with uh, pollinators um, that we need for our survival than um, some of the cultivars that we paid a lot of money to put into the ground. Our crucial ambiguity about our role as both Earth's gardeners and weeds, we are at once the problem and the only possible solution to the problem. And it is possible, as we can see in these initiatives, um, to have a daily and you know incremental small scale experience of seeing this not as a, a complete contradiction, but as um, as a way of breaking out of um, harmful habits on the small scale. I'd like to end. Um, on um, a video that I like very much. If you haven't watched it, and if you're currently in the process of finalizing your BAs and MAs and are a nervous wreck, um, it's probably a good time to re-watch this. This is um, comedian Tim Minchin's address in response to his honorary doctorate from Uwa. And in this, he um, dishes out a lot of very, well, he says wonderful things, uh, such as um, arts degrees, are awesome and they help you find meaning where there is none and um, and things like that that are in here. But he also um, advises um, in his first lesson, you don't have to have a big dream. You don't have to have a life dream that you follow. You don't have to have a grant narrative or a vision that encompasses the globe and generations to come. Passionate dedication to the pursuit of short-term goals. What he means by that is not be medi mediocre with a vengeance, but look at what's here. Look at what's directly in front of you. Don't worry about what comes next. Do this as best you can and keep an open mind. Look at what's in the periphery and something interesting will come. Whether it's weeds that you can use for something else or some other activity taking um, a new approach 
to something that you think you already know. I think I'll stop here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for taking part. And I look forward to um, hearing some questions and suggestions and essentially what you think of this. Thank you very much. Florian, over to you. Thank you so much, dear Vera, for this, for this very inspiring and insightful talk. So many interesting topics interconnected. And thank you especially also for connecting to so many of the previous talks in our, in our lecture series. There have only been three, and you mentioned them all, I think. Excellent. Um, well, uh, the floor is open, guys. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can simply use uh, the chat function, which you can find at the lower right corner of your screen. Simply click on the two white arrows on pink ground and then uh, click on the speech bubble and then right away and ask your questions or make your comments. Uh, this is possible as of now. And uh, as always, I will uh, use the privilege I have as a moderator to ask the first question uh, while everyone else is uh, still busy typing. Yet yeah, there, I found it uh, super intriguing, the point you made about kind of changing our perspective about, um, about the current crisis, the health crisis and everything that is attached to it, so to speak. Um, uh, particularly in regards to, to cultural and societal, societal issues. Uh, and I found particularly interesting that that notion of expansion of the idea or that that expansion of the idea of solidarity, which, which you presented rather at the beginning. Right. So so you said that solidarity is a principle that should be actually expanded towards non-human actors to to speak a and t so like with, with actor network theories uh, slang so to speak um mm -hmm. so, so something that is that should be or has to be expanded towards environment which i immediately thought okay this is something that goes very much against or it seems to me it goes against these current crisis competition ideas that are well, in my personal episodical uh, impression, uh, more, more and more common, so that more and more people compare crisis in terms of relevance or, or urgency and then come to a conclusion such as climate change is more relevant than Corona, which is true in itself. But the question rather or the question raised by your contribution uh, for me would be, well, how, how much does that comparison actually help us? Probably, probably not so much. Uh, so rather focus, say, on doability, focus on the on the things we saw that societies can achieve by now and take this kind of as a as a more positive uh, basis or positive inspiration for for further further achievements in this area as well, possible achievements. So my question would actually be, or it's more one of those comments disguised as a question, if you will. What, what do you think about this competition element between crises? Is it something, because as I said, I mean, you can very well say, yes, that's certainly true in the long term, say climate change is incomparably more, more important than what we're going through right now. But possibly, as I said, my reading would be, well, maybe we shouldn't ask that question in the first place. What do you think? Well, it's not a yes, no question, is it? Um, it's it's rather trying to use our imagination to see whether competition really has to be such an elbow game and whether we we should simply just because there is competition, we are at university, it's a competitive environment. Um, you can approach competition with desperation and um, and the elbows that I'm trying to sort of uh, act out in this in this video but you can also approach them as a, with, with an aim towards a, a sort of more win-win outcome um, i think when we look at solidarity it's important to um to have knowledge of our own position and in in this case i know it's it's an unpopular word and it's a word that approaches that that uh, arouses all sorts of um responses of of self-defense but this uh, in our case especially as academics who are tenured and who have a future means acknowledging with gratitude that we are actually very privileged 
So we have a future to worry about. That itself is a privilege. There are lots of migrant workers on the streets that don't that don't have a future and who have their present currently taken away. Um, so this is this is a situation where I think we need to reframe and and use the imagination to to zoom out and and think of solidarity not as a as a grand narrative or a, a master discourse or something that um we must be the first to define and and any any of these things but to um to work with um the imagination to communicate about ways in which just here today small steps can be taken to to address um the very great inequalities that exist um so i think competition can be something that you can work with in a more playful manner it doesn't have to be something um that is a matter of life and death i don't know if this helps but uh it is more like uh, it's like more like a sermon i think um but yeah i, th I think we, we just need to think about it differently whenever people present you with an either or choice um, usually we encourage the students to think around those binarisms and to find um, a more nuanced, automatically smaller scale way of framing the question so that both and is possible. Great, thank you so much. I uh, see that the first questions are popping up in the chat, so I will read out the first question, uh, which goes, thank you, Vera much to think about this weekend and beyond. Could you say a bit more about the crisis of connections, for instance, its origins and what it entails? I was also wondering if our digital era has changed only its degree, so I assume the degree of the crisis, or if it has fundamentally altered the crisis. That's a great question, Jesse. Uh, thank you. I, I kind of wonder, do you mean digital era as in what we're currently experiencing? Um, because there are different ways of reading this. But I think the origins of the crisis of connection, as um, Simone Drichel and her collaborators write about it on Ni Niobe Way and uh, her collaborators in that first book that I quoted from, they basically connected very much to modernity, to late modernity, the, the kind of um, situation that we're in. Um, it goes back to to, uh, in some ways, there is a Marxist uh, uh, subtext there. It goes back to the Industrial Revolution. It is certainly part and parcel of late modernity and the Anthropocene. Um, it's very much related to the digital era in the sense that we have, it's a bit paradoxical because we have means of connectedness that outstrip anything that has been going on before. And yet, um, what they say is that uh, our sense of connectedness to ourselves gets lost in the process. And if you think about this in relation to how we're currently operating, Christian made really good points about that in his lecture on Microtopoi last week, about how odd it is not to have a, a room full of beings who are nodding or grinning or, or texting, even that gives me information, right? There, there is a lot that, um, in a sense, the, this is exacerbated to the point that perhaps we realize what is going on that's one realization and we realize that change is possible so in a sense uh, a few i think a couple of years ago when the pokemon go game was on um you came across these zombie-esque groups of people standing in a location with, without looking at each other looking at their phones trying to catch something that didn't exist um so this kind of sense of digital era i think um exemplifies a crisis of connection right there. Even people who are in the same spot could not appreciate the locals. Sometimes they were really picturesque, um, photogenic scenes um, or, or sites in, in my direct surroundings, the kinds of things where you would, you know, zap out the phone and take a picture of the beautiful building instead of catching some kind of creature. Um, so in a sense, um, I, th I think the digital era has exacerbated it, but in a good way, because now we know how bad it is. <laughs> essentially. So it, it's kind of break, broken through our sense of, of lethargy and, and a sense of, oh, there's nothing we can do anyway. This is too large for us to, to deal with. The, the corona crisis is impacting everybody and we're all doing something about it by sometimes not doing what we normally go about and do. Right, thank you, Vera. I hope you, you, you noticed that I nodded all the time when you were talking. Right? Um, it's not that bad. I'm pretending, I'm pretending that I did. 
<laughs> great, next question on our list. Uh, thank you for this great lecture. The question reads, I would like to ask what you think about how COVID-19 influenced our view on nature. So kind of vice versa perspective, if you will. The virus itself originated in bats. We can already see how it is evolving very quickly and adapting to different environments, thus becoming more or less harmful to humans. Could this be seen as the return of sublime nature? For instance, nature, oh, sorry, that is nature as an agent that exceeds our control. Oh, what a great point. Well, partly the question goes beyond my area of expertise because um, I, I'm not um, a virologist or bacteriologist. So, but but from what I have read, um, you know, in the in the public sphere, um, many experts argue that what um, has given rise to COVID-19 is not nature, but the way that we've been dealing with it. In, uh, in the way that nature, as in the animals, the pangolins and the other animals that you mentioned, have been um, have been used and have been uh, herded together, and um, so human um, market conditions have led to the proximity um, that caused the virus to adapt the way it did. Uh, is my understanding. Um, the second part um, of a return to sublime nature, we need to be careful that we don't um, over romanticize it. Um, there are certain memes that um, uh, I forced myself to uh, to exclude for reasons of time about, you know, for instance, people taking pictures of toilet paper in supermarkets and, and quipping that um, nature is healing because the toilet paper is returning to its original habitat or um, uh, various memes that under that same heading, under that same hashtag, photograph, uh, Photoshop all sorts of uh, dinosaurs into the Venice canals. Um, this is a kind of um, exaggeration which um, distracts from the fact that um, many people tell us that uh, if we're not careful and if we don't adapt um, and use our imagination to actually change our habits not just in the present situation but also in the more in the nearer future um, what little the planet has gained by our current lockdown uh, it, it will lose very quickly so in in that sense uh, the sublime in nature was always a construct. It was always an ideal. It was never an actual thing. It's um, it's a feeling and it has been romanticized. And I think we need to be very careful and very critical of what we romanticize if it, uh, ex if it means that we look away and that we, we lose track of what is really going on. Brilliant, okay. I mean, no, there are so many questions in the list. I will just go on one by one. The next question is more a say about the practical side, about about the, the gardening topic, um, and uh, but also raises the idea of some kind of competition, albeit quite quite a different one. So the question goes: Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, given what you said about the good of gardening, how can we understand then the opposite trend, very visible, for instance, in the Netherlands, where we are all sitting right now, where people tend to do exactly the opposite, namely banishing the natural environment from their personal spaces, from their gardens as much as possible, for instance, by putting in big tiles, stones, bricks, plastic plants, photos of plants and animals, rather than letting the weeds grow wild and being welcoming to insects and so forth. Yeah, I, I, I can't help you there. I can't understand these people either, I have to say. Um, I think somebody framed the word COVIDiot for people who do stupid things in, in Corona times. Um, there, there are all sorts of uh, creatures that do strange things. We could, uh, I suppose, just uh, publicly shame those paved over areas and um, support initiatives that, um, that help the bees and carry a little bit of honey for those that don't make it back. Um, it's not something I, I think it's it's a perfect illustration um, of the of the failure of the imagination and also the short sightedness of um, people just going for whatever is comfortable. Um, I think if, if people have a moment to go to that films for action thing, um, the economy, the economics or economy of happiness film that I quoted earlier, um, they actually address 
the, the fact that um, a lot of the achievements that we've made um, in our present day society that enhance our comfort actually only enhance our, like paving over the front of your house so you can park there or something like that um, are only short term goals that do not actually enhance happiness. So all we can do is try and, and give as many public lectures and examples and hope that people discover it for themselves and uh, also accept that there is difference and um, that the bees have managed to survive so far. Well, that last part connects very nicely to the next question, actually, which is about basically what we should, as academics, make out of these insights. Uh, so the question reads, uh, many thanks, Vera, for this inspiring talk. Picking up on the inequality this crisis has exacerbar exacerbated. Thank you for this complicated word, De Constantine, really. And made visible and the privileged nature of tenured academics. Can you reflect, Divera, on the way this crisis of connection should refocus our research questions and focus? Well, again, not a prophet, just me. Um, but what one of the areas I work in, as you cited at the beginning, is life writing. And I, I have a few classes that deal with uh, people writing about their own experience. And I think this is... Um, this is something that I'm more and more taking on board as not just the topic, the plot of the class, the thing that we talk about, but also something that um, is a method in terms of uh, interacting. Right now, at the moment, um, I'm teaching in my own living room. Um, so things are, are, are shifting in terms of the personal and the public sphere. And I think uh, if we take this idea, and I'm talking about teaching right now, but um, I think um, at some point this might be reflected in the way we, we write, in the way we conduct research, and the things that we talk about um, in relation to this shift of boundaries, because this is a bit of a boundary transgression, having a public lecture. Um, I'm hoping there is no um, underwear hanging behind me. I haven't checked. You know, this this kind of thing uh, changes something about how we perceive ourselves. So I've been encouraging the students to not only read the books that we set them and then write an article, uh, write an essay about something that they find cognitively amusing, but also to go and, and find life stories in their own surroundings. I don't know how many people are here from um, writing modern lives or place of belonging or um, the Utopia class, um, Imagining Europe's Tomorrow. But um, we've been doing exercises that have to do with actually going to uh, people you know, and asking for their views, asking for their stories, approaching them as subjects of study, because it only makes sense um, to conduct academic research if it is connected in all sorts of ways to lives that are actually lived. Um, that's the only way we can keep aware of um, the privilege and maybe eventually redress it. Excellent. Well, the next question is, again, more in relation to gardening and possibly adding another another layer to what you presented on the Vera. So the question goes, thanks for your beautiful talk. I was wondering about what you said about that it doesn't matter so much whether we walk around with our phone or actually stick our hands in the dirt. It is about paying attention. I agree, says the question writer, but there also seems to be something very tactile about gardening that may be extra appealing in these times where touch of both humans and non-human objects has become so fraught. Was this tactile aspect of gardening something that you came across in your research on gardening in times of Corona? Thank you, Ruby. That's a very great point. Um, and yes, very much so. I, I mean, I had to be fairly succinct in this talk, but if you go to any of the articles that I briefly skimmed over, just t citing the titles, there is a great deal that um, goes in a similar direction um, and something that cultural materialism and eco-critics have worked on for a long time. The fact that we are talking about embodied practices and um, not just sitting in the garden and uh, you know admiring the beauty of flowers, but uh, doing something. It can both be um, healthy ex exercise, but it can also um, be something that is almost, um, that is often associated with mindfulness. The fact that you're bending down um, is a fantastic 
fantastic gardening book by Karol Chapek um, with illustrations by uh, by his brother Joseph, um, where the gardener is almost always sort of bent half halfway down uh, with the, with his bottom sticking out. It's very undignified. Uh, there's something very humbling about the uh, most of the activities that. Um, uh, that you perform, and and also the aspects of tactility. Perhaps we could add fragrance, right? Um, that yellow rose that you see uh, in this last slide. I'm sorry, I couldn't photograph the scent. It was absolutely breathtaking. So there is this sense in which we, um, and I think that relates to Jess's question about uh, the digital era and how it uses us to the visual and the auditive. Um, how the different senses are activated, and this is something that. Um, we do not use enough, right? Both in our academic practices, getting back to Constantine's question, and in our daily lives. So more, more consciousness of how important it is to get out there, to take walks. I tell my students to take walks after every Zoom call, right? Because it's so important to get away from this and to to enable the creative processes to uh, to get going that that can be triggered by other channels than just the eyes. And the ears. So this is a very, very important point. And I think um, the fact that a lot of people have gone and into not just planting tulips or, or things that that have to do with uh, beautifying the garden in in various designer ways, but have gone to um, tomatoes and and ginger and 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 salad and kale and and what what not um, includes those senses and uh, sticking their hands in the dirt is a very important thing and I hope I've encouraged at least one or two of my listeners to go and uh, maybe help out in whatever garden they have near them, have fun with it. And um, yeah, so this is a very important dimension, but it's it's something that you need to experience rather than just have me talk about it. Right, thank you, dear Vera, thanks so much. Uh, before we can all go on our, go on our post, post conference walk, so to speak, there are a couple of more questions. Uh, the next one goes, thank you very much for this great talk, Vera. I find it quite interesting that the practice of gardening can have two opposite functions. On the one hand, it can reflect isolation and individualism from Candide's garden to the not in my own backyard attitude. But on the other, it can also foster connection and a sense of planet, as you have shown so well in your lecture. Do you think we are witnessing a cultural shift from the former function to the latter? or are they always bound to coexist? Oh, <laughs> where's my crystal ball? Thank you, Alberto, what a great question. And uh, as always, very learned with uh, reference to Candide um, and cultivating our own garden and Nimbi, not in my backyard. Um, I think we are witnessing a cultural shift. I wouldn't presume to, um, to label it um, in such a clear fashion. I don't think I can do that. I can only hope. Um, and as as always, when presented with a binary, I try to find um, a third that constructively combines the two. I don't see uh, a complete contradiction in um, reflection, is isolation as mindfulness or, or a, a rediscovery of who we actually are where we stand, uh, a kind of self-discovery, as it were, on the one hand, and then taking that into um, a, a kind of community, maybe helping others or working in collaboration with others. Ideally, the two are uh, connected and are part of um, a graded scale and a, a chain of, um, of things that go together rather than complete opposites. In my free time, I'm, I'm a dance teacher and we talk about connection a lot. I left that out of this talk um, because academia. But um, a lot of the time we talk about connection as the thing that goes wrong. And in most cases, when it goes wrong, it's, it goes wrong not between the two dancers and between the dancers and the music, but it goes wrong because the person in, in themselves um, lacks balance and is using the other person to achieve a balance that they haven't attained themselves. I don't know if that makes sense in this context, but um, essentially what I'm saying is it's not an either or. It's something that... Um, is hopefully finding new and more creative ways of coexisting constructively and productively and creatively. And the next question is on yet another form of, of bringing together the two realms, uh, if, if, if I might 
call it that. Uh, the question goes, thanks for this really inspiring talk. As today we are linking digital spaces or digital practice and gardening, I was wondering whether you think this could tell us something more about the large popularity of games such as Animal Crossing during lockdown, given that this involves curation and formation of a virtual island? Or can you understand something more about the motivation to engage in these kinds of virtual activities? Thanks, James. What a great question. Um, I have never played this, so um, my experience is limited. I, I, I assume this is something um, similar to all those apps that rediscover nature and that have you, you know, sort of watch raindrops or something like that to help you fall asleep. Um, you know, whatever gets you there. Um, I think a lot of people first approach gardening not by stumbling across a, a, a bulb, not in this day and age, but even in 1988, James. Um, I've forgotten his first name, uh, a critic called Pew uh, claims that many people first discover um, a garden through a book, maybe a coffee table book. They see the pictures and then eventually that carries them into um, a nursery and garden center and then they're sold. So if this game um, gives people a kind of outlet and interest, why not? And um, Curation is a great word. Care is a great word. I mean, we all become very aware of the very many levels that care takes in these times. So I think um, the digital is not in complete contrast to the garden. I think we should, uh, or, or the physical space, the things that Ruby talked about in our question about the tactility and, and getting your fingers dirty. It's, it's um, a chain reaction, as it were, and it can be different aspects of uh, a process of discovering where we are and what we want to do with it. So I'm not against it. I'm actually quite interested to maybe take a look at it. Um, and I think I, I very much like that you're thinking about computer games because this is, of course, the next big field that we need to include in our um, cultural and literary studies endeavors as something that is very vibrant and uh, is creating new questions. And um, yeah, I'm going to check this out. Thanks for the tip. Um, that's my weekend. Um, and I'll find out more about it so I can give you a better answer when we meet in not the virtual island, but on the real one. Oh, great. Well, hopefully that will be soon. But before that, we have one other really great question. Uh, I, I have to say that personally, because it was a question like I was also thinking in that direction rather at the beginning of your talk, Vera, uh, mm -hmm. when you when you um, uh, refer to to sense or missing senses of community. So the question uh, here by the audience goes as follows. Thank you for the interesting talk. If I think about societies, even before the current crisis, I think of specific realities that share a sense of collectivity, such as Fridays for Future or the Sardines movement. However, what is interesting to observe is that often these collective identities are in conflict or are taught that there is an enemy in uh, inverted commas. So mm -hmm. we can think of groups that are connected, but at the same time, Include what is framed at, as different, which I think Vera, that's my own comment now, is also one of your one of your core topics. So othering, what we refer to as othering, so in sociology quite often. What I ask myself is how to guide this sense of community towards a more inclusive approach. So that's about inclusion exclusion, Vera. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Aurora. What a great question and uh, what a wonderful observation to uh, to make. And um, of course, um, it's it's easy to, you know, feel a bit despondent when you see that even people who are trying to improve um, our situation as as um, as a society, as a global society, um, often work with these um, pictures of an enemy and work with quite hostile forms of um, communicating and imagining. Um, I think it's a stage. It's it's a stage of coming to terms with finding one uh, finding one's identity as against a backdrop of something that is not me. It's a stage in uh, in finding an identity and ultimately, if these uh, movements are to become something longer lasting and um, you know as as the members in these communities um, 
become I, I don't know older I suppose and and um, more experienced in different ways I think hopefully they will see that um, often when we see something that is different the first instance the first reaction is to to make a mental list of things that are different and to to make this a very black and white list uh, this is me white this is the, you know it's, it's often very valuable value um, and well centered and uh, find formulating an enemy um, as you put it often involves exaggerating um, as a first step it's important as a draft as it were but eventually um, it's important to also identify what common ground you have with the so-called enemy because the common ground is that the garden that we all live in this planet is uh, is something that um, that we share. So um, focusing on the differences is um, is not perhaps the most helpful way forward. And this is why I'm talking about this as a crisis of both the imagination and of communication. Because of course, in the age of fake news and um, what is going on on the internet, you know, the, just various uh, hits and provocations uh, creating more awareness than nuance this is a very problematic situation for doing something nuanced but um this is the challenge and i think i don't have the answer i just see that this is this is i hope at least that there is a possibility of finding a different way of dealing with this and you can all look for answers there and and essentially talk to them talk to everybody you can and um try and find the similarity between the the self and the other and um, expand on that it's much more fun that way if nothing else okay dear Vera the last question looking at at the clock it should be the last unfortunately but I, I really want to take this one on as well because it starts with a nice compliment that I fully share and ends on a rather lighter note so the compliment goes thank you Vera for this inspiring talk if I'll ever learn to answer questions this well I would consider myself an accomplished scholar. Your answers are as interesting as the talk itself. I was wondering, here goes the question part, I was wondering if the literature also mentions those who decidedly do not have green fingers and manage to have every plant in their care die. I'm one of those people and I hope that there's any hope for me, haha. -ha. You mentioned watching and smelling, but doesn't that take away this important aspect of practicality? Actually, they're not green. Um, you just probably you haven't met the right plant yet, Max. Um, there are some plants. My, my office plants are actually constantly on a diet. They don't get a lot of water. They, they just get old tea. Um, you don't have to have green fingers. And um, you can just see what, what you like. Maybe you haven't found the right plant yet. Um, but uh, the idea of um hang on what was it um practical aspects if you if you're interested if you want something you're going to put some time and effort into it if um you you think your th your thumbs are out there to kill then don't don't touch you can just watch um i think a lot of the um the things to be gained from um from nature, from spaces such as the Stars Park that you're looking at in my last slide, um, you don't have to do anything about this space. It's out there. You can just go and maybe take pictures, maybe just um, listen, listen to the birds, smell, have fun. And uh, you don't have to worry about outcomes all the time. That's the great thing about even if you're an accomplished gardener, um, and that's what the literature tells you. Uh, the garden always has a life of its own. It does something unexpected, uh, certainly something that you never wanted and never planned for. And and in that sense, um, your green thumbs won't help you. Just thumbs up on any kind of engagement um, that is open to change and to possibility. Well, thank you once more, Didera. That was uh, that was a fantastic talk and a great discussion. Thanks everyone for uh, the wonderful questions posed Thank here. You. And as we're talking, more and more compliments coming in through the chat function. Vera can read them as well. So there are greetings from Dublin, which is arguably wow. a relatively green city. Last time I checked, I think. 
uh, and many other places in the world. So there you go, Vera, that's all yours. I won't read them out all, but uh, you, you read them and the other participants can read them. And I, I'm sure we all agree to that. So thanks once more, De Vera, for this fantastic talk and, and to everyone for the good comments sure. and, and the great, great discussion we had. Uh, another special thanks to Konstantin Mira for uh, being yeah, the in the participant room, as always. And a uh, very important hint regarding next week, where our great colleague uh, Elisabeth uh, Pinilla Duarte will give her a presentation uh, with the title Exclusion versus Solidarity Online Narratives of the Crisis in Latin America. This presentation will take place at three o'clock in the afternoon at Central European Summer Time, so different from today and the previous lectures. Uh, please all take good notes, of course. The announcement will be sent out. You will be able to read the abstract and the speaker info and everything else on our website. If you're not familiar with our website yet, simply Google Cultures of the Crisis Groningen. And uh, yeah, well, we know what to do. We are off for a walk now, everyone, as, as Vera has uh, told us to. Uh, so uh, thanks once more. Take good care. Thanks, Vera. See you guys all very soon. Thanks, Vera. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. You too, Vera. Goodbye, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye.